So without further ado, I'm going to go to my man, Nathan Reynolds. How you doing, bro? I am absolutely fired up. So good to be here, Billy. Man, it's good to be here with you. Um, apparently, you aren't you aren't as far away as you once were. I don't know if you want to reveal that, but uh, you might live a little bit closer to the uh, to Billy's Jungle Palace of Love. Dude, I can't stay away from that place. You know what I'm saying? It's just it's the dreamland. I haven't quite notarized it yet publicly, but there'll be a grand reveal eventually. All right, I'll just keep I'll I'll keep the lid on. I'll keep the <laughs> lid on. But uh, you are closer than you were before, so. Uh, Hopefully, folks, in the future, um, I'd like to maybe record some um, legit permaculture videos with Nathan and see what else he's willing to get into. I told Nathan before we started broadcasting here, the reason why a lot of these I'm not able to do on YouTube anymore, I know a lot of people have been asking, but folks, they are absolutely every single time, um, they're either shadow banning or demonetizing any kind of podcast I do. It's not my regular videos, but it's the podcast videos that we do on there that all of a sudden they come down like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing it exclusively on the audio platform. So, uh, yeah, Nathan, uh, don't feel inhibited in any way, man. You can, you can just rock this thing every single way possible. So, uh, before we get into it, some people are going to be new to this podcast and they're not quite sure of your background. Uh, folks, I highly encourage you to go back, check out Nathan's story, in the two previous episodes that I did with him today, I promised we were going to hit into permaculture, but man, I got a list of notes. Nathan, you can probably <laughs> see them right here. I got a list of notes of all the things I'm curious to get your opinion about, but sadly, a lot of it, I'm going to make myself not talk about most of it. Pro well, I don't know. We'll see how far we get on that one. Dude, we got to go for it. You got to yeah, go yeah. for it, man. Bro, we're going in the deep water, but first <laughs> I got to hit the permaculture because there's so many people that are going to want to know if you would maybe give them a like a, a synopsis of your background, where you come from, and it might wet their beak a little bit to know a little bit more about your background before we kind of touch into the permaculture stuff. You bet. You know, I'll give you guys a 30,000 foot kind of overview real quick. But I, I grew up in a family that was just really uh, organized crime family. That's the best way to put it. And this is just people that have been generationally carrying on the banner for them this old religion, these people that really do like bow down to the immortals and they still, they still try to hold on to this, this idea that they can conquer the nations through any means necessary. And so I just grew up in a home that trafficked me around to put it super PG. That's the nicest way to say it. But along the way in that journey, on one side, there was a lot of Christian on the other side, there was a lot of Catholic and Jesuit. And then there was this just deep occultism that all got intermixed. And so I, I experienced a lot of horrific radical intelligent abuse and suffering for many years of my life until it kind of got channeled into a direction of violence and retribution and vengeance and so i got caught up in this world of uh, hunting and i'm not talking about animals i'm talking about two-legged foes people exclusively and i just i turned myself into every level of of a of a war path that I could, I wanted vengeance and I wanted it bad. I wanted to stop the bad guys and if whatever it took, you know? And so I picked up that lifestyle for a lot of years and it ran me into the United States military and the U S army. And after a few years of that, my life was in ruins, utter ruins. And, uh, I was dumped into the field of psychology in Boulder, Colorado, and got my degree in that and kind of did everything I could to try to stay out of that underworld, you know? And I ended up meeting a woman who was not a part of the family and, uh, her and I started a life together and, Unfortunately, the, the the family wanted me back in. And so it turned into a real knockdown brawl when my first daughter was conceived and the family wanted her and I refused. And so it turned us into a war zone, you know, and they, they were coming after us and coming after her. And it, I mean, it was a, it was a nasty time of my life where we were kind of trying to live on the run and yet we were still kind of planted out in the Denver, Colorado area. And so eventually we were able to publish a book where we talked all about our story of coming out. I realized the best thing I could do was, was pull the dead man switch and then throw the grenade into the snake's den, you know, and, and release all the secrets, you know, don't, if you're going to be a whistleblower, man, don't hold it tight to your chest and tell everybody you're a whistleblower. And I've got all kinds of documents to really just release the documents. You know what I'm saying? Just put out, put out your testimony, put it out there all the way. And so that's what I did. And that's what really along that journey of kind of escaping the confines of civilization and the normal worlds, that's what led us into this, this unexpected journey into permaculture and staying on farms and staying on homesteads and starting to see this other lifestyle that honestly I had, 
I had never really known. I'd never experienced it. And it was a great place of restoration and healing and, and, uh, and a real change in my identity and understanding, man, what is this culture, this subculture that's been kind of mocked and derided our entire life? Like the, the idea of what a farmer is, the idea of what a, somebody that grows their own food, what they really are portrayed as us in our minds versus the guy that I actually get to work alongside of and the ingenuity and the, the skill sets that they had and the just brilliance of mind that is out there hiding in these avenues of backyard bistros. And it really just gave my family a totally different pursuit. So that's what a, a lot of what I ended up doing for the last five years was working in and out of the permaculture scene. And it just gave me a great appreciation and a love for all things related to a natural lifestyle. And at the same time, it gave me a different passion, you know, and I'm just really appreciating opportunities to connect with go those that have been my mentors from afar. You know, I, I was, um, I, I was checking out your YouTube channel and I got to say, man, one of the most uplifting things before we touch in the permaculture, I want to kind of hit on this a little bit because it, I've been really into this biohacking as of late. And mm -hmm. I, I think that can be a double-edged sword too. And I'm, I'm every, the, the, everybody's into biohacking. It seems these days, I mean, whether it's cold water immersion, whether it's the grounding, whether it's all these things that, you know, that have existed for time and memoriam, and now everybody seemed to catch on, whether it's um, deep breathing, which is what I did right before this podcast. I did a little five minute energy, deep breathing thing to kind of, you know, make sure I'm alert and, you know, ready to rock and roll. And everybody's into this. I think that this is also a I wonder if part of the biohacking will in the future, in the near future, be used to leverage into uh, transhumanism. Um and I, and I think one's going to go with the other. I said all that to say this. I was watching some of your videos, and I got to say, one, man, one of the most uplifting things I've seen was the one with you and your wife out doing your cold water immersion. Um, it was just a joy. I mean, I don't get a chance. I am honestly busy from dawn till dusk. I was literally with my wife running a weed eater just, you know, not, not long before we started broadcasting. I had enough time to take a shower and then come inside, and then I'd started your video before, and then later on, I was like, I, I couldn't quit watching it. It was just so fascinating to see you and your wife going through that, and before we, like I said, before we touch on the permaculture, I want to I want to ask you about that, and what all the cold water immersion, and what other biohacking, because it seems like you, you might be doing, maybe calling it something different, but I wonder if you're all going back to the same place. What role is that in your life? Dude, what a question, man. I love talking to you, Billy. I, nobody asked me about biohacking. You know what I'm saying? But this is to put it super transparently. Like I, I, my body on one side of the equation has been on the cusp of death for a long time, you know, <laughs> like, and so because of that, I have always been trying to find ways to keep myself invigorated, to keep my strength up, you know, because I've, I've dealt with so many bodily injuries. I was in and out of ER rooms 18 times before I was like 16 years old. You know, I had complex, massive reconstructive facial plastic surgeries, all kinds of stuff, issues in the military, getting shot and stabbed, all kinds of crazy crowd going on in my life. And so like, by the time I was into my twenties, man, I was like, I, I wore out my body to where I thought I was just going to die. I never, I never planned for the future. You know, I really didn't. I always planned for the imminent destruction that was around the corner. And so when I finally got to a place where I was like, I'm going to be a father, I've got to start like engaging my life with a long-term perspective. And so like, Right at about that same time, I got a job as a wilderness therapist and I, or wilderness mentor up in the mountains, about 9,000 feet in elevation. And I was outside in like a tech free zone. So like no EMFs, it was crazy what happened. Just that man, I want to talk if we can too about this book, the invisible rainbow, I'm going to do a whole series on the electric dragons. And this has been, I've been doing it. I'm ready for like a 15 part series just on this book, which is so good dealing with what the metro magnetic spectrum does to our bodies at different rates and how it affects plants and microbiology and all this stuff. I'm like, I'm running to gun that one down. Well, tomorrow, we're going to so. get along just fine, man. You just <laughs> drive on brother. I'm all about, so, I'm like, so, so along that journey, I was up there in these mountains, man. And I started having this, this hour long commute and I was studying and learning about all kinds of conspiracies and all these other different avenues of life. Right. And at the same time, I started going out into the, to the, wilderness up there, national forest outside of Boulder, Colorado and Ward, Colorado. And it's literally, as I was walking around, man, this spring opened up, like it literally just spring started up, just squirting out water. And I started drinking from that spring every day. 
and that was this the starting point of where my mind finally tuned out the kind of hush that had always been there for like years we're dealing with pharmaceuticals like the army's like job was to just drug me to death basically when i got out and i was just like chemically castrated you know i had no i had no fight i had no testosterone you know like they they neutered me yep. you know and i just felt like empty and dead and despairing and i'm like i started drinking spring water and I just was like, the lights turned on a few days later. And I was like, go figure. Maybe I don't have permanent short-term memory loss. Maybe I'm like, maybe there's a whole other story going on here. And so that's really where a lot of like my wife and I began to like research, seriously research what's going on in my body, like biomechanics. And one of the first guys that I ever connected with in that was Dave Asprey. He, he does, he'd put out Bulletproof Coffee and different product lines and stuff like that. And that just launched me into this whole world dealing with mycotoxins and inflammation in the body. And I started really really diving into trying to refine my diet to get away from genetically engineered foods, getting off tap water, you know, like that's where I think in a lot of ways, my wife's and I's like journey to restoring our minds just cranked up a notch because we started eating this different way. And all of a sudden, all of these ailments that we'd had our whole life that we thought were basically permanent just disappeared. And we're like, Oh my gosh. And that's, that's the stuff that drove us to want to eat as best as possible. Like we wanted to eat the most nutrient dense food. So like diet was a huge component of that. And that's what drove a lot of our decisions about where we lived and where we navigated our way around the country was avoiding the food deserts, you know, was avoiding these places where it was like that. But the cold water had always been this place for me that I could like, I could reset myself. That was like the thing that I began to learn. Like if I jump into a Creek or a river and I grew up in the deserts, a lot of Arizona and Colorado. And so water was so precious. And so when you found it, man, it was like gold. And I'm just, I get all kinds of giggly when I come out of cold water. I just, I laugh. And it was that, that feeling of pure unadulterated joy. That was so, it was so authentic. I didn't have to drug my way to it. You know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to get high to get there. Like it just required the one thing that I honestly lacked a lot of at the time, which is discipline. And I think that that fear of uncomfortability and discomfort is what keeps people from taking the hot water tab and turning it to cold. You know what I'm saying? But that, that single adjustment in your life, and if we chase comfort, we're going to age faster, you know? And I began to see that in my life. The more I pursued comfort, the worse I got overall that the quality of my life depreciated over time. And so my wife and I, we shared this video called my water cure because we got this book when we were living on one of these farms, you know, like people are very eclectic in the whole woofing community. You got some freak show people. They're wonderful, but they're scary freaky too. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's bizarro. You got the guy that's like, I'm only going to eat what falls from the tree of itself. You know, you got that guy. You're like, dude, you dedicate. He's like, I'm traveling the world seasonally to only eat the fruit that's volunteering to be eaten by me. I'm like, good for you, bro. You know, like dude, that dude pooped. Like you can't even imagine he had pure papaya poops, like something I've never even seen. I've cleaned out compost toilet buckets. I know what people's poop look like, you know, oh, a man. very different relationship with my neighbors at the time. But dude, uh, we started going in this cold water Creek that was on this farm that we were staying at because I was working in the greenhouse, man, in Florida, I was dying in heat. I was like, I was so hot and miserable. And so I would run and jump in this, this spring fed Creek that he had out there. And it, I come out laughing, like laughing. And so that's at the same time, somebody shared on one of my comments of a video about this book. It was called my water cure by Sebastian Knipe, K N E I P P. And it was written back in the 1800s. And I opened that book, man. And it was like, I was reading from another brother from a long time ago. And it was like, this guy was talking about the softness of men and like the machinery of the days where we're changing men that because technology was starting to be introduced men were beginning to kind of forsake the the toil you know and because of that they were getting deprived of the benefits that come through arduous labor and from difficulty you know he, he's talking about in the 1800s guys are getting soft and soggy and so he talks about really the way to brace the constitution of the body is through cold immersion and it's not just full immersion you he just localized like with a copper water pot and localized areas of treatment literally through this like liquid crystal that were like really transforming our body's way of dissolving toxins in our bloodstream and getting them out of the body it's one of the main properties we have of water and so that is where a lot of the biohacking kind of got brought in to the water culture for me was through that book and i tell people all the time you got it you've got to read that book you can get it for like 10 12 bucks and it's 
so packed with also an entire section of apothecary, you know, gardening and finding your own supplies for wild medicinals and things like that, as well as clothing. We started wearing natural fiber clothing because so many of these garments that we wear, whether it's polyester or nylon, they, they're like antennas that genuinely conduct that EMF field into our right. bodies. And so just wearing these different fibers and then getting in the water, I began to feel this, that constant pain, the chronic pain, the tension and anxiety, like I'm a, I'm a high, I'm a high edge kind of person to begin with. And when I would wear these other garments, I feel a lot more stressed, but when I was wearing that, that garments and linen and jumping in the water and letting it dry naturally, man, it was literally like toxins were coming out of my skin and staining the fabric of those shirts. And so my wife and I, we shared a video because she did a 40 day challenge of cold plunging every day in this Creek that was outside of this house that we were at. And man, I just got to watch the vitality come back to my wife after having major complications from mold toxicity that damaged her liver very severely in her gallbladder. And it almost killed her when she gave birth to our twins. And so it's just been a great journey. So I encourage you guys check that video out. It's called my water cure on our YouTube channel. It's also going to be on our rumble channel, uh, Nathan Reynolds, but man, I'd love the biohacking stuff. And I could talk all day about that kind of stuff too. Well, man, dude, we're going to have to do episode four and five and the whole nine yards. But I saw that and it was such a joy because that the cold water thing, I, I think it's uh, I can't remember who said it, but aging, he said, oh, my goodness, it's a guy that I actually listened to quite Gary Brecca. He said aging is the pursuit of comfort. I mean, and, you know, there was a guy, a blues guy named Kev Mo. He wrote this song. It always touched me. It was called Victims of Comfort. And he's basically talking about, you know, we, it's, <clears throat> I think it's just like you said. I, in fact, I know that it is. It's because of our comfortable lives. We think all these things make our lives simpler, but at the same time, by not wearing natural fibers, which slowly but surely my wife and I are starting to get into that very thing. When I realized that there is a resonant frequency to all these things, I had no idea. And then in the Old Testament where it talked about not mixing fabrics, there was somebody that sent me an article the other day and it floored me where scientifically it showed that one natural fiber had, it basically mitigated um, or put out a certain resonance frequency. I don't remember, but it was helpful. But when you mix it with another fabric, then all of a sudden it's very dissonant. It didn't work out well, but each fabric in and of itself seemed to do just fine. And I was like, good night, man. There it was all the way back in the Old Testament, I think in Leviticus somewhere. And I'm like, okay. And then here it is scientifically. We can now explain that all these things, I know people are, some people out there are thinking, oh, this is woo-woo stuff, but it's legit. And now science is proving what the Bible had said years ago. In addition to that, the cold water, whether it's baptism or whether it was watching you and your wife in that video, and she said something I thought was absolutely striking. And it's something I can relate to. It absolutely, and I even saw it with you. You sit here and negotiate with yourself before jumping in the water. But she said there isn't a single time where she ever regretted doing it and didn't feel much better because of it. Well, one hack that I do to get myself to do it, um, and I talked about it a number of times, I think, in this podcast, because I'm telling my audience out there how many times, you know, what I'm doing to get myself to do it, because the cold water immersion is so tough, tough for so many people. So if you're doing it in the shower, it was tough. The only way I got myself through it was I would start with Psalm 1, say it by memory, get into Psalm 2. Now I'm doing, now I'm all the way into Psalm 4. And believe me, I'm not going through, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly or standard. I'm not, I'm like saying it very gradually. So here it is, starting with Psalm 1. Now I'm in the Psalm 4 of the time I'm able to stay in there, especially we're on well water, so it's definitely cold around here. So it's all these other, it's a hack combined with another hack to get me to where I want to be. And it's, it, it's really a joy, man. But I, I got to say, if anybody out there, if you haven't seen Nathan's YouTube channel, go check it out. It's Nathan Reynolds or uh, Linen, Linen Railroad, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, go watch that video. There is no way you can watch that and not smile. I mean, it was really, really a joy. So in addition to the water, I, I'll drift into permaculture sooner or later, but in addition to the water, what other biohacking methods are y'all using? Dude, that is such a good question. All right, we got, I'll, I'll give you like our three, if I could tell you guys three videos of ours that are like fantastic. The water cure is awesome. That's been years in the making, but we put out this one that's called Becoming a Linenite. 
and then another one that's called becoming a millenite. Okay, those those are like the two other biohacking like realms. Those are deep dives after like my wife and I are like all in freak show level committed people. You know, when we get zealous about something, dude, we're gonna sell everything and go all in. And uh, and so we were living in Asheville, North Carolina at the time that we like we living with this lady who was always wearing linen. She was all about linen, you know, and she she found it at the Goodwill outlet store, the bins in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. All the Goodwills, when they're like done, the store, like they never discount stuff, right? They just ship it off to these bins and they just collectively dump everything into these massive bins and then people can buy by the pound garments. And so she had this like incredible linen wardrobe. She was wearing it all the time. And down in Florida, I started wearing linen and was like, I feel so much better in this fabric. I don't know what's going on, but I wouldn't give up my tactical pants. I'll just tell you straight up, dude, I couldn't give up the war belt. I That's couldn't, me. I couldn't do it. I was like, I don't care how good this stuff makes me feel. I'd wear linen at night, dude. I feel like I was a king. You crawl inside the linen pants and your linen sheets and you're like, why is it? I feel like I'm climbing into a shield when I climb into linen sheets, you know? And so that it was at the same time that one of my friends sent me this book, the invisible rainbow, which is a history of electricity and life. And it's by Arthur Fistenberg for those of you that are listening. And I picked this book up, man. And I read every stinking page of it and was like, no way. This is what's going on with me in my body. And what I'm feeling the difference of and linen has this property that's not, he doesn't even talk about like necessarily the super cures fight for dealing with electricity. Cause I'm just, I'll just gonna do a snooper snip pick of what's going on out of this book. Here's one of the major points that he gets to in here is that in the presence of an electromagnetic field, this process of cellular respiration slows down. And what, what, what causes that is that the, in the mitochondria, right? The, the energy engine blocks of our cells, when you have in the electron transport chain, this is going to be a little complex for a second, but I promise it's going to be worth it. When we eat food, it gets broken down into three basic things, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, right? Lipids. When our body takes those in, it has to go through an enzyme process to be able to bind it with oxygen in order for us to turn it into energy. ATP is what they call it. Well, there's this one particular enzyme that gets affected by electro electromagnetic fields, and it slows down the absorption of that oxygen, that binding process. And this leads predominantly to three things, right? When, when we're eating fats and they are not able to get that oxygen, mitochondria will either power up and convert energy at either a two ratio or a 32 ratio. So there's no in between. And so because of that, you always get this down regulation and the body's not able to use it as effectively. So it takes lipids or fats and it releases them into the bloodstream. This is why you'll see hardening of the arteries and you'll see like cholesterol levels going up and sticky stuff going into your, your veins and stuff that it doesn't belong there. When you have sugars and things like that, this is what causes, this gets dumped into our, our liver and having all these problems with pancreas and all of the, what we would call diabetes, the different forms of diabetes that develop. And similarly, when we deprive it of oxygen, right, this is what causes cancer cells to literally grow in our body. And so it's like, I started reading this and I was like, okay, electromagnetic fields are causing this type of reaction in our body. And at the time we were living in this RV that had this, this inverter, right? This had this inverter and my daughter was sleeping on top of it. And she started having constant insomnia. Her stomach was hurting digestional issues. She started having like racing heart kind of stuff. And I was reading about this and I was like, this used to be called neurasthenia. This used to be what this disease was called that manifested in people over in the Soviet union. They called it radar operator syndrome because people that were exposed to this over in Europe and over in Asia and over in the Soviet Union, their doctors were like, this is a serious deal and we have to rotate these guys off a rotation because they would be sterile. They would have all these heart issues, breathing issues, and it wouldn't affect everyone. But those that it did affect, man, it hammered them bad. And so at the same time, we started learning about natural fiber garments, right? Linen and wool is the two fabrics you're talking about that you're, you're, you're said in the Leviticus and Deuteronomy 22. It's like, don't mix those two fabrics. Right. And he commands that the priests wear linen and you're like, why is he all about linen? Like you can't even go into the temple with that as a priest, unless you're wearing linen. He's like, don't even put wool on your flesh when you go in there. But these guys were operating in front of fire all the time. And wear wool, it gets hot, man. Wool adds warmth to your body. It stimulates your body to warm up. And that's literally because it's like a semiconductor. It is helping your body to warm up. It's got porphyrins in it, which is literally like a pigment that our body uses to build blood. Plants use to build chlorophyll. And that's the stuff that gets affected by electromagnetic radiation. And so you put on these natural fiber garments, you'll feel different 
not everybody, right? But certain people feel it instantly, like unbelievably like calmer, like cooler, you know, and especially like working outside is one of those areas where like I was working as a tomato farmer and a goat farmer there at that property. And I was hot, man. And I was like, I feel just so much better. And I finally, we talk about this in the video, man. I finally went on a walk without my battle rattle. You know what I'm saying? All my EDC, CCW, all that stuff. I'm like, we're going to go hike in the forest. And it was on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina and this beautiful, like gorgeous park. And I felt like the wind blow through my pants, man. I felt I felt a cool breeze in my loins, man. I felt so good. And I was like, come on, man, this feels amazing. We'll figure it out. All the, I'll figure out how to carry the battle rattle and linen pants. I will do it, man, because I felt so good. I felt energized by standing outside. And I suddenly realized, man, breathable fabrics add value to our lives. They, they, in, they add to our life. Whereas we have these other fabrics that we're kind of conditioned to just wear that they detract from it. And truly you're, when you're wearing cotton, it's your body will feel a 10 degree difference of temperature between that and linen. And let me tell you, 10 degrees when you're working outside is not a joke. And when you put cold water on your skin with the linen on, it's like air conditioning when you get a breeze. So even when I was down in Texas and I was working as 110, 115 degrees outside, I could dump water on my, my body, on my linen. And then I was standing out there in that dry heat and it literally would bring me down to where I was no longer sweating. And I started experimenting with all these different ways of, of kind of hacking that as well as with hemp, which is a lot less common, but I just began to see this benefit of it. The, and the other big arena that we kind of pursued as well at the same time was grinding our own grain, was fresh milling our own flour. And so like, I know everybody is super anti-gluten. It's like, everyone's like, it's toxic. Well, dude, the version of bread that we all inherited is, it's, it is a dead bread. You know what I'm saying? For thousands of years, people have ground their own grain. And they ate it fresh because you can't take multiple day old bread. It starts to get moldy and rancid fast because it's got every vitamin, mineral, and amino acid. Like you need to live and to function when you've got fresh milled organic grains in there. And so all this kind of came together at the same time. And my wife and I began to experiment with, I don't want to have to supplement for the rest of my life. You know, I was like, I, I'm, we spend so much money on supplementation regimens. How can we find the cheapest way to get the most nutrient dense food into our bodies? And so that's, that was where fresh milled flour got brought into our life. And we, we met this gal named Sue Becker, who's down in Atlanta, Georgia, who's a nutritionist that really brought together an incredible teaching on what happens nutritionally in our bodies when we eat fresh milled bread versus this dead bread. You know, because we have our Messiah in the scripture saying, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He who eats of me will never hunger again. He who drinks of me will never thirst again. And I'm like, if it's so toxic, why is he saying I'm the bread of life. You know, it's clearly there's something here that's missing. And so it really launched us down into a study in the scriptures where we see as part of the consequences of turning our backs on, on the, the creator's way, he literally promised he would take their wool, their linen, their bread, their oil, and their water and their wine. This is the book of Hosea. And he says, if you want it, go buy it from the gods that you're bowing down to. You've gone and joined yourself to. He's like, go get it from them. And I was sitting there realizing, this is who we've gone to. We've gone to the world and they've given us dead bread. They've given us poison water. They've given us poison oil. They have, they have destroyed and genetically engineered the worst possible way to feed us, clothe us and water us. And, and this is what our creator sitting there like, are you guys done with them? You want my solution? He's like, come back to me, come back to me. I've got these simple things that have been disregarded. You know, so many of us have Bibles sitting around our houses and we've never read them from beginning to end. And so we lack an understanding about what is food, what is clothing, what is a way from his perspective that we can heal ourselves. And so we really got really fired up about this stuff, man. And so for the last few years, this has been areas that we're constantly trying to advocate. People try and experiment with and take a 40 day challenge of wearing natural fiber garments or going in cold plunging or eating fresh milled flour. And we've just gotten a community of people now, tens of thousands of people around the world whose lives have just been transformed because of this. And I really believe there's simple cures that are waiting for us when we regard our creator's ways. And we're kind of living witnesses of that in such a unique way now. I've only ever worn linen one time and I had exactly, I was in Mexico and I had exactly the same, I, never in my life did I ever wear linen until I was in Mexico one time. And it was exactly as you said, it was like, okay, I'm out here in the full sun, but I feel absolutely, I could feel all the wind come through. It, it was like I was completely air conditioned. Now, additionally, <clears throat> let me just add on to something else you said. Now, keep in mind, according to Dr. William Davis in his book, Wheat Belly, if I remember correctly, 
in that book, he describes that, you know, the wheat that Jesus ate was a three chromosome plant. The one we have today has been so bastardized and turned into this genetic freak of a whatever. Yeah, we still got ancient grains and some of these others, but going, you know, into the whole wheat thing, it's basically a poison to me unless, unless my wife makes sourdough out of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, and there's a, I mean, Michael Pollan has written extensively on that as well, where the same people that have gluten allergies really don't necessarily, you have a gliden allergy. You have a, oh, that stuff they spray on the plants. I can't think of it right now. Folic acid. Right. Folic acid. Exactly. The worst thing in the world. Gary Brecker talks a great deal about that as well. Um, all these different pesticides. It's not that the grain is bad. It's just instead of fermenting it as they would have, as it would have been done in time in mem memoriam, it wasn't until World War II that all of a sudden now we got Wonder Bread. Now we got this regular bread on the shelf. Nobody's making it anymore. Yeah, I can eat bread as long as it's sourdough and it's fermented and my wife makes it. If I eat any other kind of gluten, trust me, bro, it's going to clog me up like the Lincoln Tunnel at rush hour. It's gonna be, <laughs> I'm going to have some issues, nephew. So, yeah, it's all these different things. And, you know, I know the Bible says study the show thyself approved, but maybe I, I can't help but think that I'll, that also applies to the things we're talking about right now. Yes, I was born into this world where I just buy clothes off the shelf. I wear them. Don't think twice about it. But if I study a little bit and I find out, oh, these natural fibers, man, I feel like a million bucks. Or if I walk around and I'm not, you know, wearing rubber shoes that are made from some, it's not even rubber anymore. I mean, from this synthetic material where I'm constantly insulated from the ground. Believe me, I know a little bit about this. I'm a journeyman electrician and been one for a long time. Yeah, there's a benefit for an electrician to not be grounded. But for the rest of us, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely critical. And we would have been, if you check out Clint, Clint Ober's work, that we would have been up until I think it was the 1950s that all of a sudden, you know, our shoes were no longer natural fibers. They were no longer leather. They were no longer all these things. Our socks were now made out of this poly whatever. And it's never, I mean, it's, it's like every single thing, the powers that shouldn't be promote to us it's the very opposite that we need to be doing. And I mean, it's everything from the books we read, the videos we watch, anything they promote to us, anything they give to us, anything they make easily available is all garbage. And it's like anything that's worthwhile, man, I really, I mean, it's like you said, I mean, this stuff didn't just fall into my lap. Yeah. Biohacking is starting to be a thing now, but I'm like, okay, it's always been there. It's always been there. I was told as a kid, don't walk around with without your shoes on. You're going to get hookworms. You know, <laughs> you're going to get the Chinese liver fluke if you eat this or you do. You know, every single thing they tell us is a manufactured lie. And it's like it's all meant to just drive us into an early grave. It's really something of a testament to how well the Lord made us because we're a little bit harder to kill than the powers <laughs> that shouldn't be probably intended. But, man, I, I got to say, um, I can't wait to go in and check out the other videos you recommend, but man, you have a wealth of information, but I want to look, I'm going to kick myself and I know people are going to come down on me like Thor's hammer. If I don't at least touch on permaculture, but like I said, I got a page full of notes here. A yeah, very let's, hit the, notes. let's hit the scary notes. Come well, on. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, bro, but I got to hit this thing. You got to give me your journey on permaculture. I mean, where did you even hear the word? What got you into it? And uh, what did that journey look like for you? And what does it look like now? Oh, man. Where did I even hear that word? Paul, I didn't know I was in that world. I think because I got brought in sneakily, I would say that, you know, like my wife and I volunteered to watch over this property in El Dorado Springs, uh, El Dorado Canyon in uh, outside of Boulder, Colorado. We, did, we, we responded to a Craigslist ad, you know, and we were like, we want to live. We need somewhere to live. My wife was seven months, like six months pregnant at the time. And I was living in um, residential communities that were being built sneakily because <laughs> I was just like, I was like, oh, this community hasn't been totally finished. Let's just park here covertly. We called it, you know, guerrilla camping and stuff like that. But we responded to this ad that was like, you know, they needed somebody to watch their property while they were living in Florida. 
and uh, it was like 10 acres, man. It was like multi-million dollar property. Unbelievable. And uh, she wanted us to do gardening, you know, like plant a basic garden and then have a little food stand outside on the property. Dude, I didn't care for gardening at all. To me, it was like drudgery. I was like slave labor, death. I was like, no, thank you. But my wife was really into it. You know, she was like, she was all about it. She's like, let's grow plants. And I'm always like, oh. So at the time, though, we we started doing that on this. And you can watch this ridiculous entry of this. We called Farming with the Reynolds when we first started this. It was sad, dude. It's super sad. It's super embarrassing. But you got to show the real life. Like we try to show people the real life version of it. And we started just a sort of joke of it. You know, we did exactly what this lady wanted. And it was everything you should not do. You know what I'm saying? It was like bare soil planting directly into it you know just letting every kind of pest and disease just take over and devour it was it was all the wrong stuff and it was all the hardest ways of doing everything planting in the flood zone you know it was like we watched everything we did just slowly fail over time and it was just like why and i was like this is why i don't like farming this is why i don't like this but at the same time we had this couple that showed up and these were wolfers. These were like veteran wolfers, man. And these people like talk to us about this culture, this subculture of the wolfers. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, it's like the worldwide organization of organic farms. It may not be exactly what it is, but basically people can host workers that, that basically want experience on a farm or on a property. And they, they trade out, they work it out in agreement. You know, it's like, you give me a place to stay and some food and I'll do some labor for you. It's a great, great entry place for a lot of people. But on there, my wife and I are like, let's try to find somewhere we can go where it's down in Florida. My wife's always wanted to winter down in Florida and it's super expensive. So we're like, we, we ended up finding a farm down there, two farms that were organic, naturalish, organic farms. And we're like, let's go. And so I, we reached out to both of them. Both of them gave us an invite. I had like a two hour interview with one of the guys. He was super like grilling me because he Googled my name, which for those of you that Google my name now, it's a, it's a freak show. Let me just say it. It's all Illuminati and assassin and dark stuff, right? And he was like, I don't know if I want you coming to my farm. Uh, my children are here. Oh, like, you sound like, a. I mean, it's great. You see, you, you preach and stuff, but dude, you sound like a murderer. You know, I'm like, yeah, I, I definitely said that. So it's awkward. You know, that's an awkward introduction to people. And, uh, but he would, he, he gave us, he prayed about it, man. He gave us an opportunity to go down there and he had these pictures of his farm from the front of the road and it was like there was some lemon trees that was it i was like i guess we're going to some lemon trees but this guy's farm was like the embodiment of permaculture before i ever had experienced anything like it and we turned into this this road and he had boundaried his property with the, all like 16 different varieties of bamboo timber bamboo and eating bamboo like just incredible bamboo and then he had papaya and lemon and lime trees and all of this just planted row vegetables in an orchard of of oranges and grapefruits and pomelos and i just was like what is this i just parked in the garden of eden and i like got a park under this massive bamboo canopy and i was like this is unbelievable and so that was my first introduction to it was seeing somebody who had was 14 years in to their personal permaculture project but danny who is the owner of the farm he had been one of the directors of this place that was called echo and echo is down in fort myers florida and they are literally like a permaculture zone for teaching missionaries like agricultural missionaries how to learn they have one of the biggest seed banks in the world and they distribute out seeds but they also test out different technologies i'm talking super primitive stuff you know how to get water out of out of the ground with very primitive stuff he helped to direct and build out so much of their permaculture for almost 15 years before that and so he was dude he was super veteran and i just was a guy who showed up at his farm and didn't really want to do the farming thing but it was desperate for a place for my family and he threw me in the greenhouse with tomatoes and man i became a vine dresser for him and it changed me fundamentally because I got to learn this lesson. Like I really believe if you, if you cry out to the creator and you ask him to reveal himself to you, you ask him to teach you his ways, you ask him to heal you, restore you. He will send you on a journey that seems like it makes no sense whatsoever. Like you, you, you may think you cried out for this thing, for him to do this thing in your life. And he's going to answer it in the most peculiar roundabout way. And man, he did that for me by shoving me in a greenhouse, a place I would have avoided with everything in me. First of all, I would have never said yes to that job. I had an offer to be an executive protection agent for a guy who owned multiple private jet companies and was going to Saudi Arabia. And I was going to be his bodyguard. And I was like, this is my dream job, man. I'm going to go be like, 
I'm going to go be at the side of the Kings, man. Yes. And that I was, I had already said yes to go be a stinking tomato farmer, migrant worker in, in Florida. I was like, no, no. And so I was just, I was wrestling with this death of the old man and this birth to this new one. And in this greenhouse, man, I got to see tomatoes growing 18 to 20 inches a week. And I got to see so much food come out of this 10 acre property that it just changed my perspective on what was life, what was possible for what a man could accomplish. I got to see what family could be, culture could be, and how a man could sustain a community. Like there was 30 families, like there was 30 different groups of people living on this little property of us. And, and it was just, it was unbelievable. I'd never experienced anything like that. And that was really my introduction to it. And from there, it launched me into studying all kinds of the kind of the mainstream guys that are out there. Like Mark Shepard was a real big one for me in regenerative agriculture. And, and you know, like I just, I mean, the veterans that are out there and have been out there for a long time all started popping up for me in my life. And I began to research and study under those kinds of guys. And it just launched me into this whole little world that just brought me a whole new passion. Yeah, man, that's, that's, um, you know, I, it's funny because I kind of had the same beginning. My wife was also, I mean, she came from a farming community, farming background. I came from a farming community, but not necessarily farming background. And I started off exactly the same way where I was like, eh, man, I don't know, man, if this is, and then all of a sudden it was kind of this eureka moment that I had when I found out, when I heard about Joel Salatin, what drew me to him initially was his politics. And then I realized, okay, my understanding of what farming is, is not what I've been led to believe my whole life. It's not sitting on a tractor, raping the land. And like Jeff Lawton says, modern farming is more akin to mining than it is actually farming. You're taking everything out of the soil. You're putting fake stuff back in, just like you would if you were digging coal. It's really no different. And then when I found out, that all of a sudden it's not, it is anything, but it does. Well, it can be whatever you want. Okay. Do I want to, because what I've noticed is every time, and I've talked about this many, many times, every time I take a step toward the way I see the Lord doing it out in Nate, when I look out my window, I take one step toward that. I get 10 steps back to me. The second I try to do a reductionistic world, Western view of things, then all of a sudden your input requirements go way up. And then it's like over and over, you find yourself on this treadmill. So it only made good sense to me, like you, when I found out that, hey, there's a really another way of doing this. I can be successful at doing this. I can grow my own food. It tastes light years better than anything I could hope to find in the store. There is no going back for me. So then my goal at that point was like, how do I do this full time? Because I can't afford... Look, man, I love good meat. The only way I can afford, you go to any butcher shop, high-end butcher shop, you're never going to find a Katahdin lamb in there. You're never going to do it. The only way I could afford this food that I absolutely love is to raise it myself and process it myself. That way I know that animal, like you said, Mark Shepard, a moment ago, to quote him, his animals, according to Mark, only have one bad day. Same with mine. And when they have that bad day, they don't even know that they're having that bad day. So I can raise this food, process it myself, put it in the freezer and teach folks how to do it to where we all become just a little bit harder to kill. Because, you know, you know, when you have somebody like your background, like what you're talking about with what you can do and what I can do and my understanding of what I can go out here and look in the forest and see what's there. Well, you know what? We're kind of like a walking, not to brag or anything, but folks, in the United States of amnesia, if we don't start working out and learning to be a walking um, Hank Williams Jr. song, if we don't know how to skin a buck and run a trot line at the end of the day, well, you know, they got bugs waiting for you in whatever camp they're going to drop you off in. So, yeah. uh, man, it, you know, going back to you, Okay, so you start off with this journey. You're finding out, oh man, this is this is legit, man. This is this is awesome. Were you also finding out that medicine was thy food, and food thy medicine? Man, just to hit on that point you said about becoming 
we really do have to develop ourselves out of that state of amnesia. And I think that's why we have, my wife and I have such a passion to try to, we try to shake people awake and shout them awake and get them excited about it. You know, we're, we want people to understand that the thing that we can carry with us was the skills and the, our minds. We could take with us our minds and our bodies. We were really involved in the prep scene back in Colorado, especially around 2011 and 2014 and 2015. We were really into the preparedness community, you know, and a lot of that centered around the gun show, not to dig on the gun show, you know, but you know exactly what I mean, man. And, and the wellness side of the preparedness community, especially around us there, was not there. You know what I'm saying? Everywhere. It was so lacking. Yep. And and I'm sure you can speak on this because you've traveled around a lot and and that's part of the culture that you're connected with, you know, and I don't try to disinherit anybody through speaking out about this, but listen, we started taking our, our preps, right? I, I built bug out bags, you know, like I do serious security consulting with people to build out the best possible gear and equipment that you can. And then we go and use it, right? Like I, ha I have to, I have to know, like if I pick up this bench made, Osborne 940 pocket knife of mine. I can bet everything on exactly its functionality, its use, its edge retention. I know this thing like my pointer index finger, exactly where it is when I close my eyes, when I'm upside down, I'm underwater, when I've got my finger inside the abdominum of a lamb and I'm trying to, to, to not rupture a gut sack. Like I know this tool intimately, right? And I highly recommend it because of that. But I've tested hundreds of different knives, pocket knives in my life to land on one that I'm like absolutely trustworthy. And so like we, we battle test stuff, my wife and I, like, we're like, we're going to push this thing to the max. We need to know really what it would take. And at the end of the day, when we started doing like bug outs and we started doing strategic relocations and we started like trying to do this, the, the kind of the version of prepping that you kind of get in the mainstream, we started realizing at the end of the day, we are woefully unprepared for actually doing this. At the end of the day, we wanted the YouTube dream homestead lifestyle, but at the same time, I had no idea how to get there. Like when we sold our house, we could, we could have bought the off the grid property with 20 acres and a spring fed pond in the middle of the mountains, like my redoubt, right? The Eagle's nest that I've always dreamed of. But at the same time, man, I would have squandered it because I had no idea. I did not have the actual skills. I had the YouTube video kind of guys out there to inspire me, but I didn't actually have the skills to be productive. And that's that we've been raised by our enemies reality of our life we were raised to be stupid to the things that would give us life the things that would add value to our communities and our neighbors we don't know those skill sets by design we've been intentionally dumbed down so that we can't be self-sufficient so we don't know how to raise our own high quality protein because when you eat that way suddenly you think critically and that's dangerous in a world where they designed it for us to be stupefied and follow the herd. And so we we started adopting some of these strategies during that preparedness season by going up into the mountains, going up and hiking, like let's hike up to 12,000 feet and let's camp out with what we had. And then you start to realize, oh my gosh, why am I bringing so many magazines for my Glock? I'm sticking breaking my back because I want to bring a 308 rifle and I want to bring, dude, I was doing all the stupid stuff. You know what I mean? Like I thought I could still be like I was, you know, back in the military. I'm like, honey, I used to carry out 75 pounds. It's like I got this, you know, and I'm like <gasps> dying. And I'm like, I am not the man I used to be. You know, I, like I started facing these harsh realities of what it would really take to do preparedness properly. And I think so much of what we began to pursue with the permaculture approach, with the homesteading approach was, was developing a skill set that made me valuable on one side of the equation, because at the end of the day, man, it's a lot better to be, you could be a trigger puller. You know, you can be a security kind of guy. You can, you can run that road. You know what I'm saying? They have a place, but if you can add value into a, a multiplicity of arenas to people's lives, man, it makes you irreplaceable. And you suddenly are able to bring to people this entire other skill set than just being, you know, that guy and that gal. You have suddenly an opportunity to transform, to terraform in an area. And then you're inspiring all these people by giving them skills. Like when I started learning butchering, like you said, to get to the stage of growing the meat, growing the, the, the actual animal, to then be able to take it from out of the butcher system's hands and keep all of this. You know, you might get 80% of your hanging weight as opposed to 40, 50%. You know, like you're getting major money back. Say it, dude. I know you've run down that thing so many times. Absolutely, man. I did a video not long ago and a lot of butchers out there, the commercial butchers thought they were taking me to task. I was showing 
because I've worked in that trade. I learned at the local pig in Kansas City. You know, um, I know this trade. I know my trade. And you, Nathan, you hit, I mean, you knocked it so far out of the park. This is why I tell people you need to learn how to process your own animals, especially some of the smaller ones. And the reason why is because when you take it into a butcher half the time, you don't even know whose meat you're getting back, number one. Right. Number two, that hanging weight, a decent, what's considered a decent return is 60% of your hanging weight. Well, I can make an argument that I get 100% back because there is no waste on a permaculture farm. Every single aspect, I'm okay, so what are you going to do with the skin? Maybe you want to tan it. Maybe you want to actually compost it. What about the bones? Well, I'm going to make uh, stock out of it. Okay, what about all the other things that you would never, ever dream of getting back? Okay, let's say you don't eat organ meat. Well, I guarantee your dogs do. My dogs out here live on eggs that we produce and um, basically all the trimmings and the offal from the animals that we process. So it's, and going back to this thing, because man, I, I think we're totally simpatico on so many things. I've noticed that in, let me back up just one second preparedness and permaculture i don't see a distinction between them mm -hmm. i think they overlap in the most beautiful way but what drove me out of the because like you i started in the preparedness exclusively that area alone before i discovered permaculture and then i'm realizing okay man all the guys it's it's like a club it's not like am i the only one taking this thing seriously you had guys that had their pet things like oh i got these guns or i got this bug out vehicle and, or I got a year's worth of food. And I'm like, well, okay, so you got a year's worth of food. Where's your resupply plan, bro? I mean, I'm looking at this from a military standpoint and I'm like, what do you do on day 366? You know, where, where do you, I mean, do you just live exclusively on your stores or do you reproduce these things? These were conversations that were nearly impossible to have in exclusively the preparedness circle. So I left them, discovered permaculture. And I'm like, hold on, how are these two not overlaid on top of one another? And it seems exactly, it seems you're coming from the same exact place. Absolutely, man. There was a lack of communication between the two, you know, and, and vice versa. It wasn't just, it wasn't just in the preparedness community. You know, they, they kind of, the permaculture community also was not integrating towards the, the preparedness community. Sure. If anything, I encountered like a hard right hand away, like stay away. I don't want to hear about any of this kind of stuff. And I was like, you guys, you're so cross compatible because what you're developing, like you're turning land into inheritable wealth. That's what I began to see. I began to see like, this is what fathers used to hand down to their sons. And it was better than when they first got there. And I just, I, I, because it says, listen, I, I gave up a huge inheritance. Okay. I gave up multi-generational wealth and I, and I did it because it says in the scriptures, an inheritance that's gained early basically is bitter in its end. And I could have signed off to get my inheritance early. It would have cost me dearly with my child's innocence. Like, but I really believe that I, when I read the scriptures and it said, Yahuwah chooses our inheritances for us. It's like, man, then you choose my inheritance. Father, show, show me how you build inheritances for your children. And that's where I began to see like what a father does, like a good father. He labors so diligently to try to build something that continues to grow. And I'm not talking about a Roth IRA or a 401k. I'm not talking about a depreciating inheritance that when you, you get, when you die, you get a death tax and your children inherit 30% less than everything you ever accrued. Like, I'm talking about you get land assets and you can improve and add so soil organic matter. You're building soil health. You're building the micro rhizome layer of this incredible orchard. Like what I began to see a father could give to his son with his sweatquity, you know, like his actual sweatquity was lifetimes better than what he could give him if he cut him a check. You know, like we get these stories in the scriptures that are all agricultural, parabolically taught to us. And we're so disinherited from our identity that we don't even understand what he's saying. You know, but I was working as a vine dresser and I'm all like, what the heck, man? All these passages about being a vine dresser, lessons that could be learned in a greenhouse on the vine. I began to take them outside the doors. And even on these farms, man, I began to have these 
these ideas. You know, when you start to like get into this, all these ideas start exploding out of your head and you're like, well, I'm going to start taking these tomatoes out of the confines of the greenhouse. I'm going to take them back outside and I'm going to plant them at the base of trees because they're vines. I'm like, well, vines and what do I, I'm like, vines want to be outside under trees. They don't want to be in here. They're, they're rebelling. I see them rebelling and I see nature fighting it. And I'm like, no, nah, we're missing something. So I was totally breaking the rules and I was planting these things outside under the orange trees. And like orange trees down in Florida are all suffering from horrible genetically engineered nightmares known as greening disease. And they're, they're losing their leaves. An orange tree should keep its leaves for three years. And so they're losing their leaves constantly. And so the, the trees are fighting just to put out some leaves instead of putting out the fruit and instead of growing the roots. They're, they're really struggling. And so there's a lot of light canopy that's available, which I'm like, well, that's a vine's dreamland. You know, I was like, so I started putting the vines down under the orange trees and they started trellising naturally into the canopy of the orange tree. I didn't have to prune it. I didn't have to wrap it. I didn't have to drop it. And I started seeing, I was like, well, if I do this with 500 orange trees, I'm going to develop resistant plants. Like I'm going to develop the genetics of these heirloom varieties of tomatoes and I'm going to be able to do selective breeding. And I'm like, I could find the best possible taste and condition variant, strong genetics out of these tomatoes. If I just take it outside of these confines that were given it, man. And these were like the lessons that started exploding to me that I feel like the, this is what our father designed us to learn these lessons when we work by the sweat of our face as our weapon against the curse from Genesis three, from listening to the voice of the dragon. Like he's like, I, I got this weapon for you. It's in your sweat of your face. And I have a video on my channel that's called by the sweat of your face. And I began to look at soil health tests and I began to look at what's in men's sweat and be like, we're deficient in these very same things that that come out of our faces because we've gone towards the tractor. Like you said, a mining version of lifestyle. And, you know, I'm, and to me, all these lessons were interchangeable towards a preparedness community and they were interchangeable towards the, the permaculture community, but there was a lack of bridge builders between those two worlds, you know? And so, so a lot of what like I'm really passionate about is trying to invite people to see the other side's angle, to see, listen, you by growing a food forest, you know, planting food forest. Like I'm a gorilla gardener, dude. I like to do it illegally and sneakily all over the place, wherever I go, man. I like to scatter seeds wildly and see what wants to be there. I like the stun approach, you know, that Mark Shepard talks oh, about. Yeah. Like, I like that, man. I like my wife likes a little more order. She doesn't like the wildness kind of side of it. And so we're a good team on that regard. But I, I just got to see the fertility side of inheritable wealth coming on one side of it because. Danny shared with me a story about going over to Africa and he traveled all over the world studying agricultural design. He studied permaculture all over the world. And one of these places that he went to, they had built in this, this food forest, right? And it, it, they had so much food growing on this little village. It was it. They were self-sustaining community. Well, then war broke out. I'm talking absolute total war where they were killing everybody and destroying everything. And what happened is they came into this village, the soldiers came in during a civil war and they took over this, this village because it had this great little area and they took over all their huts, their houses, and they made it a area, like an area of operations. Like it was a base for command base and they killed all the animals they killed and they ate the soldiers ate all the meat they ate all the animals and the people were left to, to flee right and they were living on the outskirts of their village in the forest but the soldiers didn't care and regard any of the food that was coming out of the trees and so they were able to literally sustain themselves and satisfy their family's needs living in this persecuted society out of the food that was growing without any inputs nobody was pruning nobody was adding fertilizer just what had been put there a generation beforehand. And he shared this story with me just tangentially one night. And I was like, that's, that's what preppers dream of. You know, that's what a prepper should be dreaming of. That's what a prepper should think about when he lays in bed at night, thinking if, 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 if crap doesn't hit the fan in my life, what about for my son? You know, what if I leave it and build everything and engineer it now so that my son reaps the rewards of it? And to me, those are those bridges that we need to start doing as best as we can is, is objectively engineering our life that way. Like you put out a little video about a food forest in a desert, you know, like there, there is nowhere that you can't take this food production model and not apply it. It just requires 
time, energy, and intentionality in order to execute it properly. And those are those areas of discipline that all men, all women, we really need in our life. But it also comes through through wisdom. And that's those those lessons that we've been so deprived of. You know, man, I think I'm starting to think you got a bug in this house because I'm actually writing a, my next book is actually going to be called Tactical Permaculture, where I overlay my military background as a U.S. Army sapper, overlay that, which couldn't, you know, of all the professions you can have in the military, I can't think of one that works out better for the permaculture trade, but to overlay and bridge the gap in the very things you're talking about, where I, I talked about how the preparedness people that are exclusively into that have no desire to understand. And I'm, I'm throwing a wide net here, but generally they don't care anything about permaculture, but on the flip side, like you said, and you hit that other end of the equation, the people that are at exclusively permaculture, I can't get them to understand the, how you can overlay some security concerns. You know what? You got a swale out there. Could that swale be a fighting position if need be? Could it be, could you set up your, because I do videos about and I show folks how to do tactical food force, which is essentially any food force could be a tactical food force. Put your nitrogen fixtures on the outside, put all your productive trees on the inside, and they're kind of, you know, it's not there for everybody to see. But also it could be engineered in such a way to where let's say you have an avenue of approach and let's say you have your let's say your nitrogen fixtures are black locusts. You let them get tall and all of a sudden you had some threat. Could you make an abatee where you drop all of those trees in the direction of where the enemy could be coming? I mean, there is a way to where we can be uber, uber productive. I mean, like our ground cover. There's seven layers of a forest. My wife came up with this brilliant idea of, hey, look, um, you know, for our ground cover, why don't we use strawberries? Now we have a bumper crop of, we got to walk on the strawberries just to get to the fruit trees, just to get to the berry bushes, just to get to the vine layers. And it's funny, you mentioned the thing about the tomatoes. We did the very same thing in this emerging food forest that we have where we put tomatoes out there. Well, you know, a vine is one of the layers in the, one of the seven layers in the food forest. Why not? Okay. You could, could you grow kiwi up a mature tree? Absolutely. Could you grow climbing yams up that tree? Why not? Instead of having these antiseptic orchards that we have out there where they have a monocrop of one tree, why not put a guild around each individual tree, increase your ability to produce A, food, and B, also, if I don't have 50,000 of the same cultivars, if I were to take every third apple and make it a different cultivar, then if I had any critter that were to somehow get through my defenses, well, it's not a complete wipeout. Okay, you got my gala apple, but all the other varieties I have are completely fine. And it's exactly the way the Lord set it up out there. When you walk out your door, do you see a monocrop out there? I mean, you don't. You see all seven layers of a healthy forest, and there was almost no intervention by any human being, almost none. So why not take what I see out there, bring it home, copy it. Why not overlay, take that, overlay it with my military background and overlay that with all the things I've learned from people like Mark Shepard, Stefan Subkoviak, um, Jeff Lawton, Bill Mullison, Elaine Ingham, the list is long. Why not overlay all these things and come up with a cohesive system that answers all of our problems? And that's exactly what I'm trying to write. I mean, it's funny you even bring that sort of thing up because I'm actually my, uh, my uh, co-author, is actually coming over tomorrow so we can kind of talk about the outline of this book. But it is something, it'll be something of my magnum opus when it's all said and done. It, this isn't about me, but I, I couldn't help but bring it up because I'm hitting up the one side of where everything is missing in the preparedness side. And you're bringing up, oh, you know what? These people in that are exclusively permaculture, why do we have to have one camp or the other. And I could bring that up and, well, I was going to actually use that as a segue into 9-11 and get your opinion on that. But <laughs> I better I better throw the ball back to you, bro, because I'm about to go off the rails because I'm thinking, okay, we get so tied up in our particular view that we're not willing to go out there and see, hey, you know what? I'm some red diaper doper baby permaculture person. Could I learn something from this guy that's on the right side of the spectrum in the preparedness world and vice versa. But everybody's so into their little enclaves over there that we don't do any cross pollination. That's a problem. 
You bet, man. Well, people are getting monocropped, bro. That's just like the hard right. reality of it. Like we we are being forced and we've been engineered to be the monocrop culture to where we're like, nah, I'm going to stick with my, I am only a Gala Apple guy. That's it. Bro, that is my it, bro. stuff right there, bro. It's that just the way that we've been engineered to do it. It's not, it's not by anybody's volunteering towards that group ideology, right? But we're getting shoved into the group think. We're like, we have to selectively destroy any autonomous thinking processes or critical thinking endeavors of the mind. But I'll tell you, I really am passionate about trying to drive people away from the devices of the devil because like it says, like, be not ignorant of the devices of the devil. But understand that word literally has at its root like amusement, entertainment, like he has these these tricks and tools. He has an arsenal. Understand we are battling immortals of intelligence, ageless intelligence. Radical, intelligent, evil. And they've designed a society to keep us from coming to the truth, to keep us from no, coming to the knowledge of the truth. And because of that, we're stupefied in so many different ways. And they're trying to divide the house so that we can never put up a formidable defense. You understand that a defensive position, a well-fortified defensive position, requires generally a minimum a three to one on the offense to come against it, right? So if you know that, if you know your enemy's coming, right, you're going to lay in all these layers a multi-tiered plethora of defenses but if you're really if you're really an effective tactician you're going to be sending your guys you're going to be sending your counter-strike team you're going to be sending your operatives to infiltrate the offense before they even get to you you're going to be sending your psyop teams you're going to be sending this you're you are assaulting that force and shattering its formidability before it can ever make an assault that's that's the battle that we're literally in is because they understood, hey, America, let's just put it bluntly, has an unbelievable territory to try to take over, to try to conquer. And it was the intellectualism that was present here. We had more self-sufficient people spread out over a massive fertile landmass that made it impregnable, really, to invading forces. And so they sent in seditious agents to start to lead and engineer groups away from unification, true understanding and consistency of thought. They began to shatter the identity of the family, of the father, of masculinity, of identities as, as people and how we could work together to accomplish things. They did this, you know, 150 years. This was our great grandfather's generation. They, they, we lost so much of this a couple generations ago. And here you and I are trying to re-engineer our life to pick up the fragments of what used to be basic knowledge, like basic knowledge that I feel stupid when I read a book written from the 1700s, not because I can't quite understand the type of English, but because the intellectual depth at which a basic dude wrote blows my mind. I understand that literacy rates in the colonies and in the early Americas were 90%. This is in an unschooled environment. These people were proficient with predominantly the scriptures. It was the main teaching tool that they had, and they were well-read. Like they're just, just the way that they took us from that level of multifaceted capacity of of doing things. And they made us all have this compartmentalized learning to where it's like, you know what? Like when you went to the AIT for the military, you got a compartmentalized form of training. Yeah. But when you go into a different forms of special operations groups, they're like, okay, we're going to teach you everything super fast. You know, you get, you, they can download information so effectively into a person. The military's professionals at this but mm -hmm. then you go to a basic high school and they're going to dump garbage in your brain for 40 hours a week continually fifteen thousand hours of compulsory education brainwashing so that we do come out as these compartmentalized idiots we can't even get along we can't communicate with each other we don't know how to interact with each other and how to take the information like you're talking about over here billy on this factor and then hold that in my brain while I set aside, I don't agree with you on these other issues. They've, they've worked that out of us so easy. And that's because it says very clearly a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so that's why they're trying to keep us in these pockets of left, right, dynamical paradigm where you're like, which word, which wing of the Phoenix are you sit on? You know, like instead of allowing us to come and entertain 
what wisdom do you have that you can help to add value to my life? And what wisdom can I share with you that would add value? Like there's wisdom in, in a sound of many counselors. And so that's the strategy I've tried to adopt in my life is to try to read, like pick up books. Like Mark Shepard, I watched his videos on YouTube and I'm like, this is awesome. But that's a two hour conference. I speak at conferences. I understand I'm, I'm able to drop this much of the depth of the things I've learned or experienced in two hours. But if a guy wrote a book and he's like, here's my book, go read his book. You know what I'm saying? He spent his lifetime laboring to get there. You called it your magnus opum, right? This is like your preeminent work that you're trying to labor towards. You're going to put everything you got into that book, and somebody can pick that up when it's finished and download on them so much wisdom. And so I have such a I have such a passionate regard for the word and for reading text, reading books, and to in all kinds of topics, all kinds of arenas, because I recognize the schooling that I was given never fostered that. They gave me compartmentalized, forced education, but that's not how, just like in nature, nature abhors that kind of stuff. That's monoculture ideologies. But you know what? The father gives us this diversity, this plethora of information available to us. And you know what? We should pursue those same lever ever endeavors as much as we can. And by doing that, now we grow in wisdom and we can understand how to learn each other's languages. So I can talk to you in military com communication. I can talk to you in permaculture language, but I can also talk to a surgeon in his language. I can also talk to a researcher, clinical researcher in their language. Like we have to be able to be good communicators. And that's what helps to build those bridges back with people is because we can be understandable and we can relate to each other. This is, this is how we contend against that babbling confusion that they forced upon us. Well, that Prussian education model that was absolutely injected it about 100, I think you said 150 years ago, which is exactly what John Taylor Gatto writes about, probably one of the best educators ever. And he describes how we were 10 times smarter when we were in one room schoolhouses before compulsory education. Bam. That's my man There's right there. There you go. I mean, when we had compul, I mean, and then all of a sudden we got this Prussian model that has turned all, I mean, think about it, read a, and I challenge anybody out there, go read a letter home from a guy that was in the civil war with a fifth grade education, the pros, the ability to convey an extraordinary amount of information with just a few words, an economy of language that is just completely gone now. I mean, and they had to be at that time, but also we were raising autodidacts that had a classical education. I mean, Nathan, I kind of see it no different than in the classic age when Rome fell. Okay. Depending on whom you ask, you know, we went into the dark, or at least Western Europe went into the dark ages. Okay. And then all of a sudden years later, we get the Renaissance or rebirth is, you know, as what it's called during the dark ages, they lost perspective. They lost all these things. And then during the Renaissance, what was it? It was a rediscovery. And I see us in that same place right now. But just like you were saying with the monocrop, monocrop people, man, that is absolutely mic, mic drop information. right? I mean, dude, I'm going to have to use that one because that's exactly the society that they've created. And this matrix that we, I mean, ultimately we prepare it for ourselves. We can either choose to say, okay, this is the compulsory education I got. Okay. What did Mark Twain say? What did all these other great writers at that time that were all autodidacts, all the people that were founding fathers, I got mixed feelings on a lot of those guys, but each and every one of them were autodidacts. Read Ben Franklin's autobiography. And the dude can't even tell you who taught him to read because he basically just, they like, they threw a book in front of him and said, okay, kid, figure it out. And that's exactly what we've lost in all of this going right back to what you said in the very beginning of this interview is that we are now, by and large, unless we work diligently at it, we are all victims of comfort and we're going to suffer. Now there is a double-edged sword to going the way I think both of us have is that you kind of, at least in my world, I feel a little bit lonely sometimes. I don't know who won the Super Bowl. I don't know who played in it for the most part. I don't know what the halftime show was, but I guarantee you there was probably some satanic overtones in it. I don't know about those things. I just like Joel Salatin once told me, look, I can't tell you anything about pop culture for the most part. Ask me about farming and I might be able to tell you a few things that are useful. I mean, um, good night, bro. You're blowing my mind.